This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah, welcome everyone to the 2014 Cornell English Department's MFA reading. And thank you all so very much for coming. Uh, but before we get started, on behalf of the class of 2014, I would like to thank several people who make this wonderful program possible. Uh, the late Philip Friend, David L. Pickett, who funds the Second Summer Thesis Fellowship, Alan and Louise Schwartz, trustees of the Truman Capote Literary Trust, Lynn Edelstein, David and Bar Barbara Zelaznik for making possible the poetry and fiction readings that have brought an array of amazing writers to Cornell, and of course, the creative writing faculty. All incredible writers themselves, they're the most dedicated, passionate, and brilliant faculty you will ever meet. And it's been an honor to learn from them, so thank you. So yeah, uh, we'll, we'll just get it started. And, and it is my honor to introduce to you the, the poet, Kenneth Yuen. Uh, Kenneth is from Seattle, Washington, and completed his BA in English and Philosophy at the University of Washington um, before coming to Cornell. Uh, he worked as a grant writer in the technology industry. He is currently at work on his first book, book of poems, tentatively titled Vertigo Porch. And on a personal note, I would like to add that uh, getting to know Kenneth both inside and outside the classroom, I can confirm that he is truly a gentleman and a scholar. So, <laughs> <laughs> this first poem is from a series of poem letters that I am writing to the poet Jack Spicer. The city makes no sense, no more than the Greeks or you did anyway. In a thousand years, it will all be covered in gum and pigeon shit. Jack, I hate stepping in those things enough as it is. All that will remain of clean streets will be the myth of the gray, pristine sidewalk, which never existed in the first place. I've got to get out of the future and into a new poem, Jack, but I'm just getting into it here. You said going into hell so many times tears it, which explains poetry, which explains my disbelief in it, and explains how the logic of nonsense tears itself slowly from itself, building the same way setting organ upon organ in a wet red pile for the hollow-eyed gods. Jack, Prometheus's eagle didn't even like livers, but the gods didn't care, so the eagle had to keep all those livers somewhere. This is the root of all Greek philosophy. How many livers does it take to make a heap? If the liver, if Prometheus grows a new liver, is the old liver still the liver of Prometheus? What about the third? The fifth, somehow he's both immortal and gone. All we have of Prometheus is the memory of his immortal liver and how his hand brushed fire across cities in the dark. We're all in the dark here, looking for the dark. Prometheus is the origin of the light bulb, the lamp, and the on-off switch. Um, this next poem, uh, I'm gonna read uh, sort of two sections of a longer piece. Uh, that uh, is a semi-narrative poem that sort of details two people's uh, relationship as it falls apart. And so I'm going to read the beginning of it and the end of it. Um, and it's called Cranberry Morphine. And there's us in wicker chairs not talking as the evening draws on down. We stare at our phone screen's blue-white light. Someone's mad at something, but won't say or can't. It's hard to tell this time. We need to break the silence so we play a game of hypotheticals. If I was an oak, where would you plant me? What if your mother was a teapot? Would you be a smaller teapot or a saucer? Sorry, that was dumb. We hang our lives on ifs like this. We've built our empire on speculation. It's our favorite game. The spiders nearby weave their end of summer webs. We think of brooming them away, but don't. I'm sure we'll get to it one day. For now, there's something funny on the internet. It's dumb. Who cares? We laugh. Our neighbors own a bog for cranberries, my favorite fruit. Are berries fruit? It's not important. No one cares. We play one last if before we go inside. What if we owned the berry farm? That would be weird. 
We'd have to work for one thing with our hands. My God, we're lazy. Let's go in. It looks like rain. This is the next section. Well, wait, the bog. I mean, that would be fun. We smile again, and what a thing it is to own a bog. Imagine working with your hands inside a burgundy particulate, using a red lake to pull in money as you crush out juice, frozen berries, jams, cranberry sauce. Thanksgiving must be payday for those farms. And Christmas? Holiday, holidays are real money makers then. We'd have a lot to do around the time we wouldn't want to do a single thing. But for a moment now, I am a bog. You are. We dance among a thousand splendid berry implements, the rake, the shed, and freezer vat. None of these things are ours, of course. We're back. We don't own anything. We don't own much of anything. The cobbled porch light, wicker chairs, and this. The day that we have received, like they were offered to us. Lol, like there was someone tall who sold time off in parcels, door to door. Here, have a day, have two, for days are where you live, my friend. And if they were, we wouldn't know how to handle ourselves. Perhaps we'd force a crop or two to harvest, drown them accidentally, or just leave the berries to the long-necked cranes. I can't farm, and you, I know you cannot fare much better. Um, and, then, and then many pages pass, uh, they get into a huge argument, uh, and they, they attempt to go to sleep. And so this next section takes place in this sort of like uh, half-sleep state. Uh, lucidity and locked by sleep and locked in madness's mad nest of self-locked lonely logic says, wait, what? And wakes. Who can sleep like this, together and alone? You're here, but I don't want you here. I want you here. Which version of you is right here? Which one of me is wide awake? There's only one of each of us? Well, shit. Nothing now makes solipsism more than love. And more than love, love makes solipsism certain. The delusions of our half-sleep selves are laughable, but no one laughs. Instead, we loop through things we might have said. I'm sorry. Fuck off. Look, it's one of us is changing. Have you heard the one about the priest? Let's do, but say we don't. This self-enclosing curve gives me the impression we exist. It's things like this that sex and sleep can't fix. Maroon, the color of a sea of cranberries. They float on water like we float on wine. You say that drinking is another way to maroon yourself. It's true, and it will be. Okay, you say. We will continue on as on we always did. Things change sometimes, and that's okay. You'll be all right. I'll be okay. Okay rings like the echo we once heard. We wipe away the tall man and his cranberries for now. The high cloud and its sentences of rain can wait. We wait. We wake. We talk. We wait. We talk without a way to talk and wait. The moonscape slides lucid into lunacy. Your pillow is a moon of Jupiter. That's all that we can do. And this is the next section. In the morning, we will feel the words out with our tongues like new, and say the impulse to distinguish comes in flashes. Today we roll it up, we make things whole. Morning, twilight, times of day, a cranberry. It's us, cobbling together a word, a host of words to explain the cobbery, the webbery, the cran web and that mournery feeling that we get sometimes alone and drunk. It's twiberry us, twinning what last love we have between us doubling the day morn, angry and the eve night sad, the day tide entwined and entwining lips and honey, all our crannery rolling through the sky web, come sky wet, this line a list, a lot, a lick, a last, a cobweb, cob wet, tide rush and cranny, raspberry gone blueberry, cranberry cloud bank and light in all of us everywhere, a disjunct, crantidal and criernal, Received and retrieved as the round day carries it all around and over what I like best. Us two in bed, Luke lit and windowed through by the watery rising sunberry. Uh, next, next poem. And nothing lasts that long, that good. In the morning, in the cold, September gives me the impression we exist. A garbled, talking slantwise. Love you at the bedroom door. Don't say that at the front door anymore. God damn it, at the porch, through grand gestures that we fuck you too, cannot break. We will feel the words out with our tongues. A person is a mess we wipe away. 
an artificial maybe bog. I'll see you around, imparted to harvest understanding. Yeah, to understand, I guess, the years we make. Take care. We'd have to wait for water with a water rake. I'll miss you. Fuck you. It's all that we can do to know we float on wine, collapsing in white platitudes and fancies of the tall man and his cranberries, who grins and tells us that we cannot farm for days, who says, let me spell it out for you, who spells and spelled, who asks, who can sleep at all anymore, who sleeps like the long-necked crane sleep, sunberries in their throats and morphemes banked together in a heap, like blinking clouds raise up two people separated by a porch, by my every witch, my long and summer door, my poor clatter, my elision and my half-word sitting, porch-like with a light glass, a wine bulb open and cracked, gone sun-wise, gone burgundy, gone witter shins and low wear, where gone where and gone, and where, and where and turn the left ear toward the door, and ring the fall, the patter, and the long cranberry expanse to see, the bog, the leaves, the rain, the morning sky, it all so red the clouds blink twice. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, up, next up is Valor Popa. Uh, Valor was born in Bucharest, Romania. At the age of seven, he moved to the United States with his parents. He went to high school in Woodbury, Minnesota, and studied mathematics at the University of Chicago. Before attending Cornell, he worked in Chicago briefly as a business analyst. Uh, on a more personal note, uh, Valor and I uh, used to get Indian food every week where we would hang out and, and talk about literature, and Valor is responsible for introducing me to uh, uh, Lawrence Stern, Rob Way, and Borges, all of whom his work is, is heavily inflected by. So please welcome Valor. Thank you, Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would first like to thank Cornell University um, for the opportunity to be here um, among a community of like-minded writers, uh, and of course for their uh, generous financial support. Um, so the, the piece I'm going to be reading right now is an excerpt from my thesis, uh, which is a novel. Uh, it is set in, in Bucharest, Romania, where I was born. Um, and here the, uh, the narrator uh, reminisces or reflects on his, uh, his childhood sweetheart. So here we go. Most fascinating was the room where we were allowed to play. I'm not sure who it belonged to, but I'm certain now that it couldn't have been Anna's bedroom. It contained large and massive furniture that impressed even a young boy like me. And I remember having the vague intuition that it must have harkened back to a very long time ago. Among, among the many items there, I can now vividly recall three. A finely carved cuckoo clock with a wooden nightingale that nested somewhere between its gears and came out to warble every hour. A poster of John Lee Hooker playing guitar on the door, a gift from her cousins who, after the revolution, had moved with her parents to, de uh, to Detroit. And hanging up above the bed, I remember now, was a large and cheap painting of a nude lady spread out across a red satin divan, like an Olympia or Venus of Urbino. Her sleepy eyes followed me each time I entered the room. This was where we played house. House, of course, was Anna's favorite game. The rules were simple. I was the husband. She, the wife, and a pudgy blonde doll made with Anna's precise likeness in mind was our daughter. I worked in an office and she took care of the doll. When I came home, she served us dinner, usually make-believe salad, consisting of grass she dripped out from the playground below. And then we'd bed down for the night and pretend to sleep. Bedding down was a special part of the game that always required extra preparation. It was more like ceremony, unquestioned and sacrosanct, anchoring our game with some mysterious gravity, some importance we couldn't yet classify or understand. But I liked it. I liked the way Anna made her ritual fuss. I liked watching her pull out all the sheets, the blankets, and the lingerie from a dark, imposing armor that always made me think of some gutted devil, its belly splayed open to reveal silk and linen innards. 
She spent an eternity picking out her favorite sheets, her favorite colors, the best and prettiest assortment. And even though she often asked for my opinion, she always dismissed it after a quick and brutally harsh second of reflection. That's just silly, she said, and you don't know anything. <laughs> then when she'd made her choice, when she'd fixed the bed to her liking, she'd undress, shedding and tossing everything without an inkling of shame. She'd put on her mother's enormous white nightgown, and like a large blonde jellyfish, she'd float up on the bed and make room for me to crawl beside her. Won't your mom be mad, I'd ask. No, she said. Mom always falls asleep in front of the television. And then she put her arms around me. Now go to sleep. <laughs> that was the part I loved the most. She wrapped me up in her mother's soft nightgown, and I could feel her little chest move back and forth, her warm breath brushing up against my neck. And while she closed her eyes and pretended to snore, while the outside world slipped and sifted into ours, riding the somnolent calls of gypsies selling cheap cuddlery in the street below, or older boys playing ball beside the building entrance, I felt immensely privileged. I felt I had a rare and intimate glimpse into the lives of grown-ups. I tasted the rare fruits and pleasures of adulthood, and while I mocked sleep, nestled between Anna's small and supple arms, while quietly studying the strange and mystifying landscape of the nude above me, the dramatic curvatures of her hips, her bright pink nipples, and the dark and settling core of her pubis, I felt like I could readily dispense with childhood. I could skip it altogether and arrive there in that room with that same furniture, painting, and cuckoo clock, only it was real sleep I'd be awaiting, real dinner we'd be having, and a real grown woman's arms locked around my waist. The one flaw in the game was that our pretend nights were always too short. They lasted no more than three to four minutes, and then Anna would abruptly get up, stretching her little body back before rigorously shaking me awake. It's time to get up, she'd say. Time to go to work. <laughs> Once or twice, I tried to tell her that I didn't have to work so that I might linger in her arms a little more. I told her it was a holiday. <laughs> what holiday, she demanded with great suspicion. Pentecost, I said, and instantly looked away so that her penetrating gaze wouldn't make me fidget. But Pentecost is until June, she said. Pinned, helpless, I tried to wiggle out some other way and told her that it was useless to go to the office because the building had burned down. <laughs> I'd have to wait until they built a new one. She didn't like that either. The last day we spent together was in Mogirosh Park, where, despite her mother's warning not to play inside the sandbox because she'd get sick, the two of us thoroughly excavated the place for dinosaur bones and footprints. Three years later, after Anna and her mother left to live with their cousins in Detroit, when I began to feel those first pinpricks of nostalgia, the image of the little dig suddenly came to mind. My grandfather had just passed away then. My father had left us for another life in Italy, and I'd fallen sick with mumps. To remedy the situation, or at least push back some of our miseries for the time being, grandmother suggested that we take a week-long trip to the Black Sea. Surely, as it had been in her day, or when mother was a little girl, there was no better cure for a case of mumps than frequent gurgling of seawater. I gladly welcomed the change. Although I no longer had any fever, the day-to-day -day inertia the illness demanded was wearing me down, and I'd been inconsolable for weeks. Plus, I'd never seen the sea before, and I wanted very much to know if it was truly black. So we set off for Constanza by train. When we arrived, my mother rented a cheap room with two beds in an older, run-down hotel near the mosque. I can still remember seeing the top of the minaret from our window. And each morning, before the sun would rise, grandmother took me down to the sandy beach littered with seaweed and vanquished jellyfish, weighed with me into the water that was still soupy in places with flotsam treasures, from gelatinous plastic bags to migrating nebulas of sunflower seeds. And there, with considerable reluctance, I'd begin my treatment. It was during one of these therapies, while gurgling the nauseating salt water one morning and looking off into the distance beyond the rusty freighters pulling into port, that I was reminded of Anna and the sandbox. It occurred to me then that if I weren't so sick, if I weren't so frail, I could simply swim all the way across, over the floating garbage, over the dark blue edge of water, and arrive at another shore, the better shore, where Anna was presently scouring the sands for velociraptor eggs and thinking of me. Elated, I turned around and asked grandmother what was on the other side, so I could better coordinate and prepare my voyage. Is Detroit over there? I asked, pointing to the deep blue line that capped the edge of the sea. But she only gave me a sobering look that confirmed I'd been too whimsical. No, she said, that's Turkey.
Thank you. Thanks. All right, so coming up next, we have a real treat. Uh, Ms. Hajara Quinn is an amazing poet, and uh, I'm proud to say a very, very dear friend of mine. Uh, she lives in Portland, Oregon. She is an assi assistant editor for Octopus Books and the author of a chapbook uh, called Unnaysayer, which was published by Flying Object in 2013. Her poems have appeared in uh, Six Finch, Ilk, The Volta, and our forthcoming in Gulf Coast. So please put your hands together for Ms. Haji. Can you hear me? Okay. So um, I wanted to say thank you, first of all, to my, my family and friends um, who are coming from Pennsylvania and the Pacific Northwest, um, and for loving me tirelessly, even when I was tiresome. <laughs> and, um, and also, thank you to the Creative Writing Department um, for the generosity and for the time and space without which I think probably a fraction of these poems would be would have been written. Um, and a special shout out to my little sister who drove me across the country and got me here. So <laughs> on that um, on that note of thanks, this poem is called Unthank Park, Portland, Oregon. Everywhere we step, we step into the ejaculate of the sun, splurge of daisies, spree of plums. I am not ungrateful for what I have not been given. <laughs> I do not begrudge the rolling hills, their bouquets, unbridled and at large, manifold as marigolds. The sun did not stand us up. It was a standing ovation. We lay two abreast in its slow boat. We lulled there simultaneous with the zinnias and chrysanthemums. The breeze played our anthem. I am thankful for what I do not have. The sun, when it went down, made a salmon lavender diphthong that pronounced itself in us. We were two letters. We made one sound. This poem's called Getting Louder. If the rain apologizes as it falls for falling, then I am everything like the rain wetting the whistles of the leaves into green laminate. I drag my gray noise down the corridor to my desk, and then I drag my gray noise across the page. When I look up, I think of your chest hair, the lichen look on. We both live in a state of expectancy, a state of looking out of one window and then another, which only goes to show that windows are eyes more patient. If the snake fears molting before it molts, then I'm like the snake. And if not, then I remain as I was, nothing like the snake. I wet my lips, mnemonic device of the universe that I am, and read to myself aloud and getting louder. There's <clears throat> a lot of looking out of windows <laughs> in these poems. Um, this is called <laughs> We Are a Vista. A window is only as strong as its weakest view. My eyes go on importing more than they export. Wind chimes in the month of March, wind chimes in June. This is the view I'm indentured to. Leaving what you sow. The train's familiar whistle and the foghorn's bass note braiding under it make their chord as I drive along the river. My windows down under a low cut on the bias moon as it moves like a slug keeping the time in the late August sky. I had tried to sow what I wanted to reap, carrot, turnip, beet, rat tailing into their rows, but one rule is you may not enhance the lie, and I had tried to enhance the lie. A couple of mallards lift off the surface of their slug trail river into the flight of fancy. In the deepest décolletage of the mind, I know that this is right, but I take my exit too fast and think of a worm, its slow exit wound out of the apple. Is called humming or moaning. December holds us in its auditorium. We are the bated breath of it. We sit deep in the inner ear of it. A man operating a piece of heavy machinery turns it off, 
turns to listen, we all do, for the woman who even now is humming or moaning, humming or moaning, humming or moaning, humming or moaning. I can never decide which. <laughs> Um, so those, those poems are from a section called Floral Prints, and um, I'll just end with a couple of poems from a section called A Naysayer, which was published as a chapbook. This is called A Purple Balloon Between Them. Two mind readers sit in a room, becoming more and more, or more or less, transparent to one another. One thinks up a Ferris wheel and thereby plants the Ferris wheel in the mind of the other. One thinks balloon and lets go a balloon into the sky of the mind of the other. One thinks red and the other thinks blue, and so it is a purple balloon between them. They go back and forth like this. The thing I appreciate about the one I love is I am not a mind reader. It's not that you're not the same glacier moving at the same glacial pace every day because you are. It's that some days you're meltier and other days you're more formidable. And then sometimes an Arctic fox crosses your brow which is fitting in its own way, but also still surprising. And then a bumblebee occurs to you, and that's what I love, that a bumblebee would occur to a glacier in the most unforeseeable way. Um, and this is, this is my last poem, and it's kind of a farewell to these hills. It's called More Alive Than Mutton. I am building my hill I bury a bell deep inside it. It is what gives my hill its beautiful bell curve shape and what gives my bell its silence. Another kind of silence is the silence of palm trees raging in a hurricane seen from a hotel room in Florida. The third silence is the baby that we won't have that I won't name after the hurricane in Florida. I have my reasons for wanting to be more alive than mutton, but less alive than a lamb. <clears throat> And um, so the next reader. <laughs> the next reader I'm really excited to introduce because I introduced her two years ago. So we're coming all around. Um, Karen Elterman was born in Massachusetts and got her degree in creative writing at the University of Rochester, and she is currently at work on her first novel. Karen Elterman. Okay, have I successfully made this a short person microphone? I think so. Okay. So I'm going to be reading um, part of my novel, which is a word that still makes me really nervous to use. Um, it's about a, a guy who's an entomologist. And um, I guess all you need to know is he works in a sort of a natural history museum and also at a community college. Um, but this little section takes place in, in the museum when he's uh, giving a sort of presentation to some kids. Henry paced the length of the small room. If there was anything he disliked worse than teaching college kids, it was teaching eighth graders. At least the college students in his classes had chosen to be there. If not in Entomology 101, at least in college. At least they were adults, sort of. There was something about the giggling of eighth grade girls that made him feel like he was one of the Beatles being stared at through glass. They had this talent of making him feel both 100% irrelevant, but also mildly disgusting, as if when they did deign to notice him, they'd wrinkle their noses just a little bit. Meanwhile, eighth grade boys were just shabby destruction machines, cobbled together from lust and confusion. The disparity between the males was quite uncanny. From a cladistics perspective, they offered a challenge. Should they even be grouped together? Some looked like they were 10 years old. Others had gone through growth spurts, were lanky, six-foot-tall stick insects with unnervingly low voices. <laughs> but underneath, they were all the same. Their idea of humor was to crawl their fingers up a girl's neck and call out, there's a bug on you. Henry must have seen this dozens of times, but judging by the glee in their voices, they all thought it was truly original. Then the girls would squeal and pretend to mind and probably text each other about it afterwards. Did teenagers even think anymore, he wondered, 
or did they just sort of moth their way to newer, brighter blinking lights? <laughs> Henry clicked his clicker and the slide changed. He rambled. He was a dung beetle and he was just rolling his bullshit around in front of them. <laughs> Henry's lectures to these field trip groups were more collections of fun facts than anything else. He'd been so earnest when he started. He'd tried so hard to be hip. He'd told them about the etymologies of words, about how larva meant ghost or mask, and wasn't that cool? How about patera means wing, like pterodactyl? Pretty cool, eh? As if that was enthralling to a bunch of kids. Since then, he'd tried to take the Greek and Latin out of it. He'd started telling them about wasps that sting cockroaches in their brains and turn them into zombies, leading them by their antenna into their burrows and laying eggs in their living corpses. The larva growing in their decaying but still living flesh and finally tunneling its way out. That caught their attention, if only for a moment. <laughs> but then a teacher complained that it might negatively affect their well-being, and that was the end of that. That's why he was standing here talking about metamorphosis something you could put a positive spin on, growing and changing and so forth. Henry clicked play, and the video on the slide showed a time-lapse sequence of a monarch butterfly unfurling its wings in the sun. Really, this process takes several hours, said Henry, but here you can see it unfolding, so to speak, in a matter of seconds. He looked around the room. At least eight of the kids were playing with their phones. Two of the boys were poking two of the girls in the backs and making faces at them when they turned around. What was even the point? In 10 years, these kids would just plug USB cords into their heads and download into information into their brains matrix style. Or they'd all be severed consciousnesses floating in a soupy internet ether. Henry scanned the room for the teacher. She was in the back with her legs up on a separate chair looking into a compact mirror. She looked to be about 18. She angled the mirror toward the light and held a mascara brush up to her eyes. Henry wished he could open a secret chamber in the ceiling and dump a cascade of live insects down on the heads of everyone in the audience, <laughs> like balloons at a game show. Surprise, he'd yell, it's time for the bonus round. Instead, he clicked the two little left pointing arrows and played the video backward, so the butterfly folded in on itself. Then he minimized his prepared presentation entirely. He opened a video of a forest spider eating the head of a yellow grass butterfly. He full screened it. The spider was chowing away, using its forelegs to shovel more of the body toward its mouth. One of the girls in the audience let out a high-pitched sound of surprise. So as you can see, said Henry, the caterpillar turns into a beautiful butterfly that lives happily ever after. The gift shop is down the stairs to your right. He turned the screen off abruptly and stood there looking vaguely forward, his eyes unfocused, his heart pounding in his chest. He felt a strange hysterical euphoria. Would he be fired? Who knew? So what if he was? But what was that sound in the background just now fading out? Had someone been clapping? As he looked out across the room, everyone was throwing backpacks over their shoulders, knocking their chairs back so they squeaked across the floor. Had he finally lost it? Had he applauded himself? But no, thank God for that at least, his hands were down at his sides. The young teacher had finally stood up and was staring at him in disbelief. But she didn't confront him. Let's go, she told her students. Line up and meet in the lobby downstairs. With a sudden buzzing cacophony, the students swarmed out of the room. Henry knew he should be worried that the teacher might tell his supervisor, but he still didn't quite feel connected to that rushing anxiety. Amazing that they hadn't stripped the room bare, he thought, as the students disappeared down the hall. He could hear their laughter echoing back along the walls. He closed the heavy wooden door. Then he lay down across four of the tiny audience chairs. He hadn't locked the door, as the museum didn't close for another hour. Anyone could walk in on him at any moment. And yet, he felt so suddenly completely drained, he couldn't even imagine sitting up, let alone collecting the chairs, stacking them, throwing out the gum wrappers on the floor. The hard edges of the seats pressed into his back. He closed his eyes and listened to the reassuring soft whir of air through the vents and the ticking of the clock. Sometimes he liked to think of the day as one mayfly lifespan, of hours as units of life, which they were, of course. If he were a mayfly born last midnight, he thought, 
he'd already be two thirds dead. So that's the end of that. So it's my pleasure to introduce the poet Erica Foreman. Uh, she's published in so many journals that I won't even read them all, um, <laughs> but you can read them in your program. And I guess most excitingly, uh, perhaps, is that she has a chapbook coming out, um, which is called Dream with an Empty Chamber. Um, I guess since we're ending with personal things, um, actually she was my roommate for a little while. We lived in a house for the summer that was full of spiders. Um, and the rest of the time, she lives in a really beautiful lake house, uh, which we're all kind of jealous of. But it's OK, because she invites us over, and because uh, she writes amazing poetry, too. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. It wasn't full of spiders, just Karen had a really hard time killing them on her own, so I was happy to help. <laughs> um, first, I want to um, give thanks to Cornell's program uh, for giving us the space um, and time to be able to create all these lovely things. Um, all the faculty are amazing, so I won't single you out, but you're here, and so thank you for all um, that you've done. And also my amazing cohort. I have like the best group of poets and fiction writers that I could have possibly asked for in a community, so thanks, guys. Um, I'm going to start off with two poems from my working manuscript that is also my thesis. Um, and the first one of those is called... Trauma is as trauma does. Since the wired eyed man couldn't tell ours from the crack house next door, white as base when it was good, or dingy as Aunt Nora when rocky, those kids next door, clothes just raggedy, mommy said, couldn't play over. One day, a tan, rusted out car with a sick muffler grumbled away. I never saw them again. For every flicked flame to pipe, their mother spit out a pearl. Their daddy's greasy willows stuck to his yellowed shirt. After school, windows open, I'd hear them suckling that love affair until he smacked it, then smacked her around. Mama said she knew it was coming. The night I dreamt glass crash, mama yelling higher, higher. I tried to pull myself up by those riverbank roots, those branches of sleep, out of that boiling water. I stretched my arms, and a brown vine yanked me right into the dark. The flames kept spill reaching for the sky, swallowing our little Dresden house. Mommy drug my limp, wake body down the drive. She wouldn't wait on Dad laid up with some woman or at the group home working. No one could have told him, tonight your wife will learn to save herself. Blue Magic, Detroit, 1995. Weary from the war it took to detangle a tender-headed child's hair, Mayma takes the reins from my mother, tired of my wriggling away. Thick tooth comb, parting fields of naps, bushels of kink pulled through rubber bands, roots stretched to stalks, brown and bound by metallic black thread, fastened at the click of two bright marbled orbs. Each Saturday night, my mother and I would do this dance, and Mayma, being the from the shore of Mississippi woman she was, had no room for our libretto. My mother's fussing and cussing, the rafter pitch of my wail. Just right of her reach, a thin yellowed belt, a promise to pop my balled up fish should I think of breaking free again. A thunderhead after its washing, drops of conditioner thick water absorbed into tufts of tough strands. She pulled the plaits tight, slathered my raw scalp with blue magic. I learned to grit and steel, 
learned this work of being beautiful was wrought for us. Tears for what hands could do. Exorcism of wild rind corkscrewed from the fruit, making my grandfather's line repent its wayward ways. Cast you out, wild vines of river line. The devil is a lie in the name of hot combs and blowouts, bobby pins and silk scarves. Mama's hard-earned fingers of healing, my mother's, the fingers of dreamers. They must have been proud I began with football and foot races in the streets, though once my mother, picking me up from school, saw me smooth down the sides of my hair while watching a boy black backflip across the grass. I pinwheeled after, slowed only to tuck what was loose behind my ear. Next morning, I took my time with that slender brush clear gel at the ends of bristles, scooping the fine wisps along my temple into shales. We wilt down seven miles singing along with Anita Baker too early in the morning for all that heartbreak. And when I refused her kiss, she must have set out front for a time, all the mothers watching the sidewalks empty, each of them white knuckling the steering wheel as they drove away. These last two poems are from um, my forthcoming chapbook, Dream with an Empty Chamber. Um, it's a collection of elegiac poems, and so this portion of my reading I'd like to um, dedicate to my friend David Blair. Hungover Obeyed. Oh, eight empty ale bottles, empty pint of whiskey, half-empty water glass, still so much thirst. The day warm with this morning's coffee, the porch bursting red with flora, acorns fire against wood slats, roll away undetonated. See two men in the toggled fishing boat cast their lines into the glass lake. Silence between them reeled in slow, then flicked out again. The sun too bright for sleeping, having given the night before over to gulp instead of dreams of a body colding over, a body done with blood blossomed at its mouth, wrapped in its white sheet on the floor of a cheap motel, whose leaving split open every blue and yellow pill just the same, salting the wound until it burned and then burned no more. Even the trees move on, the old oak's leaves know the coming season is for dying and falling away. Every goddamned bird in chorus, ushering new through their small, eager beaks. Throb and throttle of temple against the light twirling as a chime in the water, against the wind, against these men waiting to hook one wet gill, against the steady rush of the gourd behind my leg, dangling from the hammock, against the smoking cigarette, dragging in each and every way to slowly enjoy the killing of what kills. Everything in its right place. Yes, I stole that from Radiohead. <laughs> Give me the heron silhouette at the dock's edge, bill sheathed into its breast, ripples of lake light, a slivered silver path toward the tower on the hill. Give me an old boat rumbling in the distance, wave wet rocks and limbs of wood on the shore. Give me comets of headlights across the hillside, the train caterpillaring past blinking houses, Morse code for no one is sleeping. We are making love and dancing on the floors with our bare feet and having red wine waiting on the moon. Give me crickets and cicadas raising the night, a 300-year-old oak tree thrust through the deck. Keep your warnings against deer, their blood-sucking accidents. They, too, are arrested with what drives them toward the dark. Give me one long-burning cigarette, one pint of ale, a lover who knows why I turn from the morning when the palms wilt and the crows come. Give me the avocados before they rot and the capsules good poison, if only to hush the hunting season, to keep from being both the bullet and the gun. Give me a body not hollowed by regret, 
Let me eat the yellow and green gifts of harvest, make room for the cell's repair, blood cleansed of every sickness. If youth meant learning the body's music, the cunt's clumsy willing, hunger before it had a name, give me back the years of backseat boys and stall girls, eager hands grappling at the hooks. I have always known this kind of longing, dull scythed horizon, fog spreading its skirt of sadness around every sail. If only to steady this staggering obsession, I want to be the boat's blade parting dark water, the clock's white eye, the heron waiting despite its bruised wing. I want to believe in what believing believes, this body made breakable, this body broken and bursting with possible violet light. Thank you. It is my great, great pleasure to introduce to you Isabel Gilbert. I'm so excited about hearing her read. Um, official bio, she grew up in Los Angeles, California and in Atlanta, Georgia. She earned her BA in English and in creative writing at Georgia State University. And before coming to Cornell, she had a career as a Pilates instructor. Her goals in life are to be happy, healthy, and to write every day. I think she and I might be the more reclusive of the group, <laughs> but we share an office together, and every time we get a chance to connect, it's always um, very grounding and lovely, and she's so kind and very generous, and so I hope that you give her a lot of warm applause. So without further ado, it's going to be So I'm going to read to you half of a short story. Um, I'm afraid I might leave you on a bit of a cliffhanger, and I apologize in advance for that. It's called Brass Treasure. I met Jill when I was 12 years old and living in a van. My mom stopped at a payphone in Clovis. It was a hot day, and I sat on the van's running board, attracted to the glittering gypsum in a pool of parking lot sand. Jill's mom was getting product. My mom wanted to sell it. From Humboldt, she got weed. From Mexico, she got coke. From Fresno, apparently, she got acid. Someone had connected them. I didn't know who. When my mom came back to the van, she said, get in. There's a girl your age there. I asked what her name was and whether I'd get to meet her, but my mom didn't know. It was late afternoon when we arrived. I'd been to other trailer parks, but this one was sparse. The trailers were far apart and no grass grew. Some were covered in rust. Some had wooden and tin shacks built up against them. We drove past most of the trailers toward an oasis of brush. My mother drove around the brush, and on the other side was a large, new-looking tow trailer and a Ford F-Series pickup. I heard a series of pops, then a whizzing sound. My mom stopped the van, and I got out. Firecrackers, my mom said, over there. I looked. I saw Jill. I'd had playmates in Humboldt, and I saw other kids sometimes in restaurants and at rest stops, but they had houses and bathrooms and clean clothes. I never understood those kids or liked them. They seemed tame, like they were house dogs, and I was a wolf. But Jill, Jill was tall and skinny, her bony knees balloon-like on her stick legs. Her light brown hair was pulled back into greasy ponytail. Her skin was dark and tan, mottled pink and red with scabs, scars, and mosquito bites in stages of being scratched. She wore shorts that had, probably years ago, fit her and been white and she wore a loose gray bra. She had a box of matches and a bag of firecrackers. I walked up to her and she said, this sounds like a machine gun. She lit the fuse, took my hand, and pulled me away. What's your name, I asked. She asked. Katenka, I told her. My name is Jillian, but really it's Jill, she said. We held hands during each explosion until the bag was empty. Early evening was still and bright. It was summer. I followed Jill to the trailer, watching the perfect pointy bones in her long spine as she walked. I could still feel the claustrophobic warmth of her grubby hand, her slender fingers entwined with mine. Inside, our mothers were sitting on the couch smoking a joint. Two, mans, two men sat at the small table attached to the wall. The window unit whined chilly air into the trailer. Everyone had a large can of beer. 
Both men were the kind my mother liked, large, loud, with big hands and big boots. When we came in, one of them was saying, I bet it tastes good too. The other man said, that one's wearing a bra. They all laughed. Jill led me to the kitchen. We both understood when to be quiet, which was often. Jill took a can of onion dip and a bag of potato chips from the cupboard. We sat side by side on the floor, our backs against the wall. I held the chips in my lap. She held the dip in hers. The length of our thighs squeezed together, warm, and the food tasted good. We licked our greasy fingers and folded in the familiar smells of pot smoke and beer. She told me she had a cat and that we should go outside and find it. She went toward the brush that hid her trailer from the rest of the park, and I looked underneath the cars. My mom, Jill's mom, and the two men came out of the trailer and squeezed into the truck. They were arguing about nacho toppings, and the dark-haired man said he liked muff sandwiches best. The truck's radio turned on with the engine. Jill's mom called out to me not to eat the pizza, then they drove away. Neither of us found the cat. I told Jill they'd left. She said they wouldn't be home until morning, probably. I'd sometimes slept in the van alone, parked in some man's driveway or some bar parking lot. I hated it. With my mother there, we could always leave, but alone I was trapped. It was different with Jill. I hoped they never came back. Jill went inside and got her mother's pistol, a Kimber Rimfire 22. There was a range on the property, just benches and broken bottles surrounded by dirt berms. Jill showed me how to load the clip. I loaded eight bullets, but my thumb got tired, and I couldn't load the last two. Then she shot the gun eight times, and beautiful mists of dust bloomed around us. It was so loud, I put my fingers deep in my ears, and the ground shook. The sun started setting, and the sky turned pink. Jill asked me if I wanted to try, but I was scared, and I said no. Then she asked me if I wanted to make brownies, and I said yes. She told me when someone got murdered, you had to get rid of the evidence. She put the gun on a bench, and we hunted for the shiniest shell casings so the police wouldn't find us. We went back to the trailer, our hands full of brass treasure. I sat at the table where the men had been sitting and watched Jill mix eggs and oil into brown powder. Then we watched the brownies bake. We watched the surface dry and crack like the desert. We tried to let them cool, but couldn't wait. We ate the whole pan with a shared fork and cleaned it with our thumbs. Hey, you like rum, she asked. Yeah, I said, but I'd only ever had whiskey. She took a cola from the fridge and split it between two plastic cups, then added three generous capfuls of rum. That's how Charlene likes it, she said, my mom. I took a sip. It's good, I said. It was good. She took my hand again and led me to the couch. I sleep here, but we can watch TV. China Beach is coming on, she said. I don't ever get to see television. We don't have one, I said. I love Nurse Colleen McMurphy, she said. I loved Nurse Colleen McMurphy, too. <laughs> the baby doll voice, the short hair, the outdoor showers. We sipped our drinks. The more I drank, the further apart my head and my legs got, but I never felt drunk. During a commercial, Jill took our cups back to the kitchen and returned with more of the same, but stronger. I had a sip, then put the cup down. After China Beach, we watched the 11 o'clock news. Jill finished her drink, then mine. We watched a rerun of Empty Nest. Jill turned the volume low. The alcohol made me feel like my skin was greasy and my mouth was full of powder. Jill was listing sideways, her head on my shoulder, her mouth near my breast. She smelled like scalp, rum, and firecracker smoke. It was dark and quiet outside, except for a small mewing at the trailer door. Let's take a shower, I said. You got a water hookup? I don't feel good, she said. Please take a shower with me, I begged. I stood and pulled Jill to her feet. I put my arm around her waist and led her to the tiny trailer bathroom. Take off your clothes, I told her. <laughs> You'll never guess what happens next. <laughs> um, so Emily Oliver co-runs Knox Writer's House, a digital audio map of contemporary American writing. She was awarded the SICA grant to record writers in Ireland and the Cornell Council for the Arts grant to produce Epigraph, a sound story. In addition to her professional accomplishments, Emily is the beloved mama bear of the MFA program. <laughs>
Um, if you're new in town, she will find you an apartment. If you go to Emily's house for a weeknight meal, you will happily be joined by four more dogs, two more cats, and ten more people than you were expecting. <laughs> If you're sad, Emily will hold you while you cry. <laughs> if you are hungry, she will literally bake you a loaf of bread. Yeah. Um, she's currently working on her first collection of films. Hey. Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you to the program, but uh, it's so generous, so much time. It's been wonderful to be here. But I really just feel like the best part of being here has been like hanging out with you guys, and I'm so grateful. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, okay, I'm going to read a couple poems. <laughs> It was hard to pick poems, wasn't it? Kind of hard. Yeah, it's kind of hard. Okay, uh, this is called The Fence. We've been sleeping in an empty black box theater, our many storefront lives. Enthralled by an easy speaking part, I throw an elbow in my voice, a woman familiar with this terrain. By the lake, when the kitchen doesn't need you until noon, we try to think of jobs that could be of any use. Past us, a fawn deer sprints her child face into the fence of the dog run. She leaps away and goes back into it. Stick legs tri triangle in fright. She shudders hard and the fence shudders back. Its steel latches swallow an apology. I hear my voice for the scene are running the deer off, but we don't, and watch her collision repeat, propelled away by panic, back again in what we both recognize is protest. Okay. I wasn't going to read this poem, but it's for my friend. It's a new poem. It's for my friend who's having a really bad day today. So we were talking in workshop about... Um, about blessings and how poetry can be blessings. So this is a blessing now. <laughs> um, okay, uh, it's called Standing While Kristen Gives Me a Breast Exam in Her Living Room. <laughs> Kristen is a nurse. <laughs> uh, before now, I've always been young. In a marvelous disor disorient, like from a sunrise window on a fast train. Perennial embrace of a new village, its brick avenues and my stumble away. I've been young, the thunder from a station, but stuck these last years renting the top of your husband's slanting house. Before, I only grew myself, surpassing myself was not gardener to these hard bulbs you find here between us. They are not cancer, though we don't know that. The lights are ready off and your keys in your hand. Do you know how many pairs I see in a day at the hospital? I am holding my shirt to my neck as your thumb rounds a thick rooted stone opposite my heart. Um, this is called Cherub. Is it more like Route 34 or more like a tree branch? A tree branch or the bone white flagpole? The flagpole or like December? More like the flag or more the Housatonic? That river's road I drove away on or like a heart, more like a human heart or is it a screech over intercom? Human or more like a mechanical arm, the arm untended in the face of children, the triangle face of an eagle, face of an ox, the winged thing that waits by the river, stand by the gates for those who still imagine dawn. More like my sister, or more the ice in ram's pasture. My sister, or the bone white traffic hazard. Is it more my sister, or more a hometown? The town, or where I like to say I'm from. Was it more home, or a thrown in window? The glass mouth open, why? A vigil of stuffed animals in snow. 
Okay. Okay, and then this one, uh, I'll read this one. Uh, this one's called Audubon Street. Lie down next to me, a city limit I cross and cross. Moonlight's second river on the current through the were mill towns. Houses hunched on, as scarecrow mothers inside. Then a boulevard, skyward promise, an industry made towards the night. God, pretend I'm from your city. Girl too busy with a toe behind the town line. Instead, outside an old temple turned mausoleum, turned school for us blind to popular shines. In another time, the women here said, sure, it's a dynasty, but no one chooses who their fathers are killing. A gunfight over rival pizza parlors and a restauranteur shot through the head. Or was it the busboy? Now the square blooms the pink of brains. Let's kiss on the fence to the community garden before I see what humiliated, before I see the humiliation was not the old man crying, but that he could not stem his tears into flowers. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to read this last one. Cool. Uh, this is about uh, something that happened when we were in Ireland in May, so I thought I should read it. A jump at 40 foot. Women already swimming easily, their arms pedal around their swim caps, older than twice my years, afraid for my blood of blue shock and drowning, older than the woman I am the grown daughter of, older than the man in the novel, though he also swam here, salt bastard cold spilling the rock lip. When I sputter so brave, the swimmer laughs undepleted, well fortified, she tells me, for water, inches of fat. I gather the spill of my stomach to say I am too considerable, fortified, furnace hipped for warmth. I've welcomed in the stranded. Already, I've washed a woman standing in a shower, hand on my shoulder so she did not fall. Already, I've turned away from three types of gasping men, plundered myself more elegant stories. I saw that flood rising. I've grabbed at what I've wanted, the swimmer, and I climb the cliff face jump. No, she laughs. You are just a little slip of a girl. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Last but certainly not least, uh, Joe Neal. A friend of uh, and I were recently saying, actually yesterday, uh, that there's something about Joe Neal that calls back to like a bygone era. <laughs> and we all first noticed it in the earnest and diligent way he conducts himself in the world, but it was further confirmed in his love of bowling. Um, so it might be a result of his Midwestern boyhood or his time at Denison University where he got a BA in cinema. Uh, wherever he learned it, Joe's sincerity certainly translates to his fiction, which has been published in Superstition Review and is forthcoming in Salamander. He's working on a collection of, of stories and a novel, which we all can't rate, wait to read. Thanks so much, Joe, for being our MC. Thank you very much. Was, um, and I'd, I'd like to give a special thanks to my family and friends who came up from New York. This story in particular um, gives me an opportunity to thank uh, the folks in my workshop. Uh, this story's gone through a couple, couple drafts within the workshop, and, uh, and I thank, uh, with everyone's help, it's, it's gotten better. It went from the kind of terrible thing it was to something uh, readable now, so thank you for that. Uh, the title of the story is Rooms are subject to inspection at any given time. <clears throat> I stomped the snow off my boots and signed back into the halfway house, carrying two boxes of instant stuffing. 
The television in the common room showed the Thanksgiving parade to an empty couch. A sleepy-looking Garfield was kept from floating away by a spread of cable tethers. Aside from the low chit-chat of the parade commentators, the house was quiet. It would stay that way until the middle of the night. Someone on the floor above me had spent last night crying. I didn't knock on the ceiling. Without a baggie or bottle to fill the hole, there was little you could do sometimes but let a big wave crash. I watched the parade for a moment and went up to my room. My prepaid phone still had minutes, and I didn't like to use the one in the hallway. Some guys had nothing better to do than take note of your business. I dialed home and the tone whirred in my ear. Outside, the snow had started to stick. An old woman across the street shoveled her sidewalk. Her head was wrapped in a clear plastic hood. I could hear the scrape of her shovel through the window. Yeah, hello, who is this? Hey, Dad, I said. Tim, did something happen? No, I'm fine. Is everyone coming over there today? Yes, but I was thinking I could bring some stuffing. It's really not a good idea. I need you to see me like this. I don't even smoke. Timmy, how can I? How can I after that awful business? My head is right. That awful business. Dad, I'm here. I pulled up the blinds and let them drop. The plastic tip on the end of the string snapped against the windowsill. Max, Dad's old beagle, barked on the other end of the phone. I have a job, I said. That right? Just washing dishes, but it wears me out. Plenty of time to think, huh? More than enough. That's good. Listen, the damn dog's going crazy. A motorized can opener throbbed in the background. You still there, I asked. Not this time, okay? It's good you have a job. Maybe here soon. I understand. All right, then. All right. A cube of butter melted in the boiling water. I added the powder from the pouches and doctored the mix with onions and mushrooms. While the stuffing was setting, I ironed my nice shirt and pants. After a splash of brute, I signed out carrying a casserole dish covered with aluminum foil. A couple guys were in the common room watching football, not talking to each other. The snow reflected in my headlight beams and blew across the state route like white sand. The heater was broken and there was no radio. Answers had to be measured and honest. Eye contact should be made, but no jokes. Family members who have seen your mugshot don't want to hear about wild times. Positive and somber, that's what they expected. I took a breath and nodded, yes. A doe jumped in front of the car. There was a single thump and the doe went forward 10 feet. The stuffing hit the dashboard and scattered on the floor. The windshield wipers knocked left, then right. There had been that instant of commotion and now nothing. The engine idled in a low drum. Snowflakes tapped on the windows. I parked on a patch of gravel and dialed the police with my prepaid. White farm fields stretched out on either side of the road. My orange hazard lights flicked on and off. The doe was white from the street light, then orange from the hazards. I watched for a while, and it occurred to me that a car might swerve around the doe, slide off the road. The double yellow lines in the middle of the road were raised a little. I moved my dress shoe across to feel the difference between the road and the line. White specks landed in my eyes and melted. The longer hairs in the doe's fur lifted in the wind. It seemed the best way to drag it was by the hooves. I stepped closer and crushed a small pile of road salt. The doe snapped its head up and I fell back. I could see that its front legs were broken when it reached the side of the road. The back legs ran independently, pushing the doe's front end across the snow. It stopped trying to run and bunched itself next to a tree. I got back in my car. There was just enough light to make out the doe's long neck and pointy ears batting away the falling snow. A police cruiser parked behind me. The officer left the blue and red lights spinning. I stood next to him on the gravel. He held a large flashlight to his shoulder and shined it on the doe. You'd be surprised how much this happens, he said. Isn't that right? It's hard to straight kill a deer with a car in a 45 zone. A truck or a semi will do it. He kept his eyes on me after I nodded. What's your name, son? He asked, turning toward me. Tim Fairmont. From around here? Close by. Close by, huh? Yes, sir. Still using? I'm sorry? You don't remember me. No, sir. But you know why I asked. The radio on his shoulder let out a call on a code of numbers. Yes, sir. That's good. I don't buy blackout stories. That's weakness. You're not weak, are you, boy? His leather belt crunched as he stepped closer. He pointed his flashlight to the hood of the cruiser. Sit, please. The officer moved the pen light in front of my eyes. I could just see him back there in the dark, looking hard for any flicker. Remember is all you did these days. The eight balls, 
the grocery store vodka, and the bouncer who wouldn't let you in the bar were all photographic. The blood and flesh on your keys you used to slash the bouncer were colorful and in focus. The hole wouldn't fill that night, and your animal crawled out. You remember the officer, his incredible strength, and thick wrist in your throat as he pulled you away from the bouncer. You remembered how calm he was in the drive to the station, how he kept looking at you in the rearview mirror. The officer clicked off his pen light and rested his hand on his gun. Snow was gathering on the plastic brim of his cap. He has a big scar right here, the officer said and slid his gloved thumb from his cheekbone to his jaw. He's retired police. I know. You know? Yes, sir. You know what that means. Yes, sir, I know all of it. All of it, huh? Another coat of numbers came from his shoulder. Stay right here, he said, and snapped open a leather strap on his holster. The officer kept the flashlight at his shoulder and the gun to his side as he walked toward the doe. Though the doe pushed its front end to the edge of the field and stopped again. The beam from the flashlight traced up its hind legs and stopped on the head. The doe's black eyeball reflected the light for an instant, and then its head flipped back from the sledgehammer force of the bullet. Monroe to dispatch, the officer said into his shoulder. Go ahead, dispatch crackled. Get Pudge on the line. Tell him we need a pickup on Route 4, about two clicks before the overpass. Copy that. I looked at the front of my car while the officer filled out paperwork. A clump of hairs stuck out of the grill. They were coarse and tough like the hairs of a broom. I threw them into the snow. A diesel pickup truck with yellow flashing lights backed into the grass. Pudge looked like a professional wrestler. He talked to the officer, and then we all walked over to the doe. Pudge knelt down and put his hands on the doe's ribs. Probably too much, mud, probably too much blood and the muscle to use. But you want the meat? We can do it for you, Pudge said to me. Oh, no thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he gathered the doe's legs, two in each hand. <clears throat> Excuse me. He gathered the doe's legs, two in each hand, and hoisted it onto his truck bed. Its head bounced off the tailgate. Thanks, Pudge, the officer said. You all have a good night. Pudge drove away. The officer handed me a piece of paper. You have a nice holiday, Tim Fairmont, he said, and got back into the cruiser. The spinning lights went off. The officer turned onto the state route and sped away. I got in my car and watched the snow gather on the windshield. The flakes hit and slid down to the wipers, making a little white pile. How sweet it would be right now. The quick snort, the drip, and a little vodka chaser to keep from getting too fast. You never lost the taste, the way it made you see the world, the harmony of all the functions coming together in the powder on the tip of a key. My prepaid beeped. The battery was dying. Relatives' cars lined the street and driveway. I pushed the spilled stuffing under the passenger seat. I stood in the street and tucked in my shirt. One of the doe's hairs had stuck to my coat. I swiped it to the ground and kicked snow on the top. Max barked when I came in the back door. I snapped my fingers and he put his nose on the carpet. Dad came back with a mouthful of food and a smile meant for someone else. He had put on weight in the stomach but looked strong as ever. A glob of mashed potato was in the corner of his mouth. What did I tell you? Your cousins will be scared. Can I just say hi to everyone? I have to get back for curfew. Jesus, he said and wiped his mouth. Real quick, go easy, okay? Sure. We hugged and he patted my back. You're still my boy, he said when we let go. You've just made it real hard. I know. You go in and I'll make you a plate. Okay. You didn't make that stuffing? I waited to the last minute. The store near me was out. He slapped my back. You have to plan, he said. Everyone was in the television room. The adults had trays and pillows on their laps. The kids were on the floor. Aunt Clara cried when we hugged. Harold gave me a strong handshake and said to keep my head up. The kids wouldn't look me in the eye. I went to hug Grandma Ruth and kicked over one of the kids' sodas. Someone gasped softly. Anna June was down on the carpet in an instant with paper towels. I said I wasn't staying and everyone was more relaxed and saying goodbye. Dad handed me a plate with aluminum foil crumpled over the edges. Never again like this, he said on our way to the back door. I understand. Drive safe, he said, and we shook hands. I signed back in. The television was still on in the common room. I sat on the torn couch and watched the news. People all over town had volunteered to scoop food for the homeless. It was going to stop snowing tomorrow. You could see the green from the radar moving away from the county. I took the foil off the plate and worked it into a ball. I didn't feel like going upstairs for utensils, so I ate everything with my hands.
Thank you. <laughs> so uh, thank you all again so very much for coming. Um, please come upstairs and uh, have some beer and wine and finger foods. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.